Hi, everybody. My name is Adeo Ressi. I'm your host here today for an AMA on VC Lab and venture capital in general. And we'll be taking questions from the audience and the Q&A, as well as uh, covering some things that I think everyone needs to know about the venture capital industry should be really exciting. Just by way of background, uh, for me, before we jump in and a little bit on uh, VC Lab and Dessel Group, et cetera. So I've been an entrepreneur or investor for the better part of 30 years. About half that time, I've been focused more on entrepreneurship and the other half, I've been focused more on the investment and wider ecosystem. Uh, I got fortunate and I had two separate billion dollar companies by the time I was 30. Uh, you know, I've taken a company public, done a lot of different things. Uh, served on the board of the X Prize for a really long time with tons of luminaries from around the world, um, and then you know really turned my attention to to making the venture capital ecosystem better. I wrote the original Safe Note. I've created things like the Fast Agreement for advisors and uh, companies to work together. Created a lot of the modern concepts in venture legal, both on the startup side, the VC side, et cetera. Uh, and so I've been a pretty prolific uh, in, 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 in my activities, created the Founder Institute, which operates in about 300 cities around the world, helping to create um, idea stage companies, uh, and then launched the Dessel Group, which I'll talk about, which is really the focus today. So the Dessel Group um, is, is modernizing venture capital. Our tagline is we're unlocking the potential of venture capital because we believe that venture capital can be a force for good in the world. We believe that ethical and transparent venture capitalists funding things that matter will have the single biggest positive effect on world affairs, period. It will... the Technologies of the future are funded by venture capitalists today, and these technologies set the stage for what happens in the world. So if we fund, you know, lots of, uh, you know, fossil fuel based technologies, we're going to have a future where we're still burning fossil fuels at levels that just make global warming and climate change a, a much greater problem. Conversely, if we fund things that are reducing the consumption of fossil fuels, that are working on problems like climate change, that are addressing food security and the like, we can actually have a future that we can all be proud of, right? And so that's really the genesis. That's our why at Dessel Group. We believe that we can help launch, you know, thousands of ethically minded venture capital firms that want to fund things that matter and build a bright future together, right? That's, that's why we're doing what we're doing. And so what we do at the Dassel Group is three things, training, tools, and capital, okay? So we have the leading venture capital accelerator in the world called VC Lab. It has launched half of all new managers in the last two plus years. So if there's a new manager in the world today, one or two of them were probably launched by the VC Lab program. And we're actually growing. So in 2024, we'll probably be more than half of all new managers. And I know like a lot of people are like, well, you know, I don't need an accelerator or whatever. It's obviously much more than an accelerator because we've launched more than half of all the venture capital firms worldwide. We provide really the playbook, the tools and everything else you need to launch a venture capital firm and fund in less than five months. It's like four-ish months on average right now. And to give you a sense of scale, if you were to start out today and say, without the help of something like a VC lab and go, I'm going to launch a firm and a fund, 
the average time is 18 months. And, and it's like 24 months is not uncommon. And so the idea that you can do it in four months is, you know, when, why wouldn't you do whatever you could? And by the way, it's free. So it's not like, ah, oh, you know, well, I could launch it in four months, but it's going to cost me $50,000. No, no, no. It's absolutely free. And in fact, the playbook that we outlined to get you to launch in five months, you cut out expensive fund formation attorneys that will charge you an arm and a leg. You cut out, um, you know, unscrupulous vendors that try and strong arm you into like signing three-year agreements with no outs. I mean, it's like, industry is littered with real trash that are trying to uh, take advantage of managers because whenever there's lots of money at stake, uh, there are a lot of vultures around trying to pick on, uh, pick off pieces of people who are trying to do something meaningful and important in the world and you know, fund formation attorneys and organizations like Carta like rank high on the vulture list. Um, we're going to give you tools, techniques, and systems so you don't need to spend crazy amounts of money. You can launch your dream firm and fund and do it quickly. Um, so that's the training side. In addition to training, we do tools and capital. So let me talk briefly about those two things, and I'll start going into the questions. So right now, we have the leading venture capital operating system for new and emerging managers. It makes running a venture. So look, uh, it, it, it's, it's great software. I'll even show it to you briefly. Um, and it really makes launching a firm and a fund uh, a, a much better experience than anything out there. And again, it's free for people in the program, right? So you don't have to spend, you know, thousands of dollars a year on affinity, thousands of dollars a year, on DocuSign, thousands of dollars a year on DocSend. I think their premium data room package is two thousand dollars a year. I mean, these and it, you know, it, we replace all of that and we give you tools for free. And there are nine hundred firms that are using it today. Okay, so it's like a double digit percentage of the operating venture capital firms are using that software platform to run. So that's the tools and now quickly on the capital. So we have a fund of funds that invests in new managers and we're matching limited partners with general partners at scale. And we're starting to see seven to 15% of target fund sizes for managers that we feature coming inbound. So you as a manager go out there and say, I'm launching this type of firm and fund. And you can see, again, between seven and 15% of your target fund size. So if it's, let's say a million dollars, it could be $1.5 million, or excuse me, $10 million, it could be $1.5 million coming in inbound to you by being featured in our, in our uh, essentially a marketplace. Because LPs, are looking for innovative new managers to invest in. Now, I mentioned I want to show uh, the platform for a second and then just jump to questions because I think it's a, a, a pretty powerful tool set. Um, so let me just, uh, and tomorrow we're having an event where we're going to be going through the platform and giving access to it. So maybe, um, Domenica, if you could put the link to the event in the chat. And I'll just share my screen quickly. So this is a um, uh, the platform. Uh, I'm looking at a pipeline. So it's like a CRM with digital signing, data rooms, et cetera. Right, so it's got classic CRM functions. You can group by different things. Last contact, you can group by stage. Uh, prospects are organized in stages. Uh, you have integrated digital signing. So when someone signs something, you can see it metadata on it here. You can click and actually see what they signed right in the platform because they sign right in the platform. Uh, in addition to that, you have like full information on the prospect. If you've been emailing with a prospect, you uh, everyone in your firm that emails with them, you see the full email history consolidated. 
Uh, you also see when things were done, like when signatures were done, et cetera. And beyond just tracking and doing all this type of stuff that's really powerful, um, the tool allows, is integrated with AI and does really neat things. So let's say you wanna search for LPs, right? So you can go down to our AI toolkits and you can go, let's say to the LP archetype advisor, um, the tool supports multiple different funds. So if you're on fund two, you can have fund one and two in it, or if you're doing SPVs, you can have SPVs in it, but let's go to, let's say fund one. And I wanna find LPs for fund one. So the tool has my thesis for fund one in it. So it says, okay, is this your thesis? Yes, it's my thesis. Now it's gonna start looking for LPs for your thesis, okay? So here it's starting to say, hey, I think an LP for your thesis might be angel investors, uh, tech angel investors. Another type might be exited founders, right? And so it's, and it's profiling them. You should look for founders of a successful GovTech startup, exited via acquisition, board member of multiple GovTech. So it's like telling you the type of people to look for um, high net worth individuals. And of course, if you want more, you could just ask for more because this is all being done by AI. But the cool thing is it then also creates search terms that you can go and use to find them in places like LinkedIn. So I just go to LinkedIn. I can, let's say, go to my first degree connections here. Um, I could see someone like a Ron and say, oh, Ron might be a really good LP and I know Ron. So let me go into Ron here. And then I can go, we have a browser plugin, also powered by AI. So I just click it and it reads the page and it says, oh, there's this guy named Ron on the page. Let me create a profile for Ron, right? And so hopefully that will happen before I die. Uh, you know, sometimes AI can be a little slow. Uh, usually this happens pretty quickly. Let's see, um, do -de do all right, I want to try that again. Uh, hopefully this time around, it will be a little bit faster. Um, okay, it was a bit faster. Yeah, so now it's created a profile for Ron. I can just click import. And then if you look over here and I go, uh, Ron will appear in the added uh, area of the pipeline. Hopefully there he is, boom. Uh, usually it just appears, but... Uh, I know we're making some big updates to the platform, by the way, on the back end. So they're deploying code right now because tomorrow we're doing a massive demo. And for one of the first, it's the second time in history, we'll be giving away invitation codes because you can't get access to the platform unless you're in the accelerator or you're invited. So we'll be giving away invitation codes. So we're getting it all ready. So anyway, now Ron's in the system. And the system also has like powerful emailing tools. So it's very easy to prospect LPs, but it's also very easy to outreach. So let me just, um, uh, I'll get rid of Ron because, you know, they're, they're, these are real people and I don't, you know, this is all demo data. But so let's go and like email someone like Anna, who's in the company and this is uh, fake data again. So I pull up an email for Anna. We have pre-written email templates for all different kinds of things, scheduling a call, um, doing a quick introduction, right? Uh, and then, of course, our email templates are not going to be that fancy. They're pretty plain vanilla, right? So what we can do is we have AI here too, so I can click Enable AI. And AI is going to read all the notes on Anna, all the history with Anna, everything that's happened with Anna in the system. And it's going to customize an email to Anna. Now, this is a formal email, but I could say Anna's a friend of mine. And so it's going to make a shorter, kind of more uh, concise email. Uh, and of course, it also knows my thesis. So it's talking about GovTech. But uh, let's say we want to make it funny. Uh, so it's going to make it add some jokes and things in there. So the idea is that we've made it very easy for you as a general partner to run your firm. And I just demoed here um, limited partner tools, right, where you can source limited partners very easily, add them in, 
You can reach out to them very easily um, and all the way to getting investments very easily. But this does that not just for investments, the tool does it for doing uh, startup deals, running your back office. Everything is made very easy by Desselhub. And as I mentioned, we'll be covering that tomorrow. And it's fully integrated into the VC Lab program. Uh, so we'll be taking you through building your firm with all the tools that you need to do it. Now, we have a bunch of questions already in the Q&A. So what I'm going to do is start going through your questions uh, top to bottom from voting. So if you see a question that you like, use the thumbs up icon um, and, and we'll, go, we'll go through each and every one of your questions. Uh, and, and I'll take some tangents. So don't forget to ask your questions now, though, because as I mentioned, questions will come at the end and get pretty busy. All right, so how much of a fund should be allocated to secondary and follow-on investments? This is a question by Heather. Um, for fund one and fund two, I would basically assume zero. Um, and if you can uh, get a, a large enough fund size to do more than zero, that's great. Let me just explain why. Um, so you... When you're launching your firm and your fund, uh, you're, you, you should really look at it as a minimum viable product. And so your fund one size will likely be two, five or $10 million. I know a lot of people here are gonna be like, no, 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 I'm doing a $50 million fund. I can tell you that the number of people that have successfully raised a $50 million fund on fund one is very, very small. Okay. It's very, very, very hard to raise fund one. So you're mo you're better off to say my target fund size is two, five, $10 million. And if you're very lucky and you get to 20, oversubscribe. It's better to oversubscribe than undersubscribe. And so what happens when you oversubscribe? Well, then you can do follow-on investing, right? So you start out the gate on fund one and fund two without a follow-on investment strategy and you target a smaller fund size and you won't have the resources at that smaller fund size to do fall on investing. And if you do really great at fundraising, which is the goal, but it's harder than you think, right? Then you do follow on investing. Now, I probably wouldn't do secondary investing. That's not really in the thesis of most funds, but follow on investing is a very good way to improve the returns of a venture capital fund. But you need the resources to do it. And so, as I said, it's just in my experience and I've launched half of all funds worldwide in the last two plus years, you know, managers want to get to 50 or whatever, but they end up getting somewhere between 20, 10 and 20 most commonly. And so starting at 10 or five, and then oversubscribing. And if you get a big enough oversubscribe, then you tack on the follow-on strategy. There's another question from Heather. Um, also got, uh, actually, whoop, uh, let, me, let me update the most upvoted uh, change. So keep those upvotes coming. Um, Dapo is asking, how does VC Lab program connect accelerator uh, participants with LPs? Um, so, we do, but you should not count on that as a strategy, okay? So let, let, let's talk about that. This is a very important point, okay? There are people in the world that will look you in the eye and tell you they're going to give you LPs, and they are liars, all right? It's not new and emerging managers do you just it's not possible right because the it's just so when you hear that 
run. So I'm not going to tell you something that's not true, but a lot of people are going to tell you stuff. There are other accelerators in the world that promise this. They are not telling you the truth. It is not possible. Okay. So I'm going to, now that's a high level. Okay. So that's the brush strokes. I'm going to go into a little more detail because like everything in the world, you, you know, that's the right answer, but there's a lot of nuance. Okay. So the reason for that is um, new and emerging managers are really untested, unproven. And so you kind of have to prove yourself by getting at least to a first close, possibly a second close, before anyone that you don't know will invest in you, okay? Because it's like, why would I, like, I might invest in you after people that know you have backed you, but not before, okay? So it's, possible for you to get some introductions to LPs after you've done a first or second close because you've proven as a new and emerging manager that you can raise money, um, at which point you're somewhat de-risked and it's possible to meet third parties. So what we do are at, at uh, Dassault Group and VC Lab is once a manager completes a first close, we have uh, on their you know, first, second, or third funds, we have a uh, matching uh, situation. And I can show you what it looks like. Well, let, me, let me share my screen here. Um, and we can profile you to limited partners that are looking to meet new and emerging managers that are de-risked because they've completed a first or second close. So I'll share your on my screen and show you what that looks like. So the, the LP, the limited partner sees a, this is a obviously fake data as well. Uh, so they see an, a, a page like this uh, and they can search, they can browse and they can find managers to invest in and they click a button that says book a meeting and so you'll get inbound meeting from lps that um from the network and the requirements for that are that you number one complete a close and are you know uh, so and then we look for the strongest people the strongest managers to feature but again if someone is going out to you and they're telling you that they can get you meetings with LPs and people that are gonna invest in your fund, they are bullshitting you and you are a sucker and you should run, not walk away. So period, I'll just leave it at that. All right, uh, let's keep going with questions. As you can tell, I'm gonna be a little bit brutally honest with you. I don't do as many webinars uh, because I'm really busy these days. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to try and cut to the chase on a lot of things and, and, and um, be blunt. I know you came up with the safe, uh, Vlad is asking, which everyone uh, counts to Y Combinator. Uh, I actually gave it to Y Combinator. So um, I, I wrote the safe with Wilson Sonsini. It was actually called something different. It was called Convertible Equity. And a couple of the lawyers that worked on it at Wilson uh, were leaving to go become YC in-house counsel. And they asked, hey, can we bring this document to Y Combinator? And I said, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I made it to give away. I didn't make it to sell it or anything. So, you know, if I'm giving it away anyway. Why wouldn't I give it away to YC? Uh, they renamed it uh, the safe, which was probably a good idea. Convertible equity is not the best name. Uh, because it's it's basically we took convertible debt and we turned it into convertible equity. That's the original name. Uh, they renamed it, and and it, you know the rest is history. As some time has passed, and now it's time to modernize venture capital. What is the next safe you foresee as a great uh, startup investment instrument? Um, 
very good question, actually, Vlad. Uh, you know, I have the next uh, 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 document. It's awesome. It's called the ACE because I learned don't name something bad. <laughs> name it good if you want to take a, take off. So the ACE is um, convertible to common. So I, I, I went and spoke with most of the top lawyers in the world on the VC side and on the startup side. And um, interestingly enough, they all said the same thing. I said, like, look, if we were to fix startup investing, what would you say the most important thing is? They said, do away with preferred, right? Like I'm doing a preferred round right now and it's taken me 45 days, 45 days to do the agreements. It's, it's you know, it, there's a lot of reasons why it's complicated, but and my my VC has uh, a thirty five thousand um, dollar reimbursable legal budget. Like, come on! Like, and like what? The, and 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 we planning to go public, right? So there is a lot of IPO provisions in these preferred agreements, but like the, like ninety percent of all the stuff in preferred agreements never gets used. And the times they get used are in downside. And like, you know, if you're spending a lot of your time and mental energy and life force optimizing for the downside, you have failed, right? You Ventures about optimizing for the upside, right? When things go south, yeah, try and help, but don't like whip out the legal agreements and be like, well, you know, on page 98 here of the preferred agreement, I get the desk. It's like, if you're collecting desks from startups because they failed, you have failed, right? So, you know, these preferred agreements are, are ridiculous. They make no sense. So we got to move everything to common. And the ACE the why it converts to common is while your money is outstanding, you get preferred rights like lick prep and stuff like that. And when your money is spent and the next investors come in, you convert to common, right? So all shareholders are common, but while the startup is spending your money, you have some preferred protections. So the ACE is a new vehicle we've developed called that converts to common. Now it's gonna completely just fix the industry in a lot of ways that it should be fixed. Uh, and we're gonna roll it out once um, Decile Group basically leads the industry, which is happening. So we're about half of all new managers, about you know, 10 to 20% of all operating venture capital firms are on the platform. And eventually all LPs will be on the platform, all deals will be on the platform, and therefore all VCs will need to be on the platform. And as we get closer to that happening, we're going to roll out complete rehauls of financing agreements and all this stuff and just fix the industry once and for all. And of course, it will be iterative because the ACE is a great agreement, but it, like the SAFE is a great agreement, but it's massively overused and, and probably uh, abused. And, and, and I, I was like, ah, maybe 50% of early stage deals will be the, the SAFE and then, you know, 25 will be convertible debt and the other 25% will be just, you know, standard preferred. It's like 70% is the safe or 80% is the safe, <laughs> like, you know? So it, it, you, you have good, good intentions are, you know, paved the road to hell. Uh, so, you know, I, I think the safe is massively overused and I can talk a lot more about that, but we got lots of questions coming in. So let's keep going. All right. Um, thank you, by the way, Vlad, that was a great question. Get your questions in the Q and a, all right. Um, Heather's asking, should we offer a copy of our fund term sheet to prospective LPs? Um, so, you know, I don't, uh, good question, Heather. You should definitely join uh, a, a VC lab because these are questions we'll be covering in the program. Um, sort of. 
like, look, everybody here should be doing a two and 20, uh, period. Like, I, I don't think the two and 20 model is the best ever. It, it's very good for funds at 100 million or maybe even 150 million and below. Two and 20 is a great model. What happened is they take this two and 20 model that's really good for funds at 150 million and below. And there are about $7 billion funds have a two and 20 model. And you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> that's not right. So, uh, you know, and it's literally crazy. So the two and 20 model is kind of great for 150 million and below. Pretty much everyone here is going to be doing $150 million and below fund, whether you know it or not. Uh, you may want to do more, but you won't. Trust me. Uh, so you you're going to do the 2 and 20 model. So the terms are like, we're doing a 2 and 20 model. <laughs> you don't need to send that out to say we're doing the 2 and 20 model. Now, back to what you should do um, is you want them to sign a pact. And maybe could you put a link to the pack materials in there on Go VC Lab, um, Domenica? So PAC is a non-binding letter of intent to invest in a fund. For most of you, you're going to bundle closings and there'll be a few weeks or months from when an LP says yes to when they invest. And so you want to get, I call closing an LP a process of getting a series of sequential yeses. Yes, I'm interested in what you're doing. Yes, I want to meet with you. Yes, I want to see the materials. Uh, yes, I'm interested in investing. Yes, I'll sign a pact. Yes, I'll sign the LPA. Yes, I'm going to wire. So somewhere between five and 10 yeses are needed to close an LP. And so using the pact, which is a non-binding letter of intent to invest is a important yes step towards getting an LP to invest. Uh, we recommend doing it. It differentiates between a soft circled and a hard circled LP. Okay, let's move on with questions. Remember to upvote and get them in. Um, a Achilles is asking, Adeo, can you comment on the fund management cost, not the management company? I know you have a post on this, but I'm keen to understand the cost relative to fund size. Assume a Europe-based fund. Um, yeah, so the, I think you say fund management cost, but that's management fees, right? So, um, so I'm not, I'm guessing that's what you're referring to. But let me just, I'll explain fund costs and economic, I'll do like a brief fund economic um, overview. So you got carried interest, which is the upside, and you've got management fees, which are the operating fees. And management fees, you also have the organizational expense, which is, um, which I'll cover as well. So I'll sort of organizational expenses first, management fees and carried interest we can clarify if other people have questions. So your organizational expense is normally capped. These are reimbursed expenses from the limited partners for all the setup fees of the fund. So all your legal, all your blah, 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 everything. And they're usually capped at like 50 or 100,000. Uh, sometimes you can see them go over 100,000. A lot of times you need to spend more than 100,000 to get the fund off the ground. So you go negative on your organizational expenses. We have a program called Dessal Partners. Um, Domenica, maybe put a link into Dessal Partners. We have fixed organizational expenses. Um, and so you can go below your cap uh, on setting up your fund. Uh, which is the goal, but most people go over their cap. There are all sorts of hidden expenses in setting up a fund. So uh, lawyers are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to charge you 35 grand to set up all the entities. They're like 35 grand. That's great. What they don't tell you is that might not include the Manco, right? So you need the Manco, the GP and the LP set up. So a lot of times they create a boilerplate Manco, but then you have to customize the Manco. That's another $20,000. 
That doesn't include all the closings. So like, oh, now you're closing, that's another 20 grand. So there's a lot of hidden expenses in setting up um, the entities. Uh, and you know, at least with Dessel Partners, there's no hidden expenses. So that's the first block, your organizational expense. And Europe is super expensive, okay? So in Europe, your organizational expenses are really high. Europe LPs are really cheap. Uh, so they're going to qual them down. So you could be, because you often need licenses in Europe, like a Uvica, um, which is a marketing passport in Europe. Uh, you know, it could easily cost you 150,000 euro uh, just to get the bare bones minimum off. And you might have a cap of like 75,000 or 100,000 euro on your organizational expenses. And that 150,000 is bare bones, right? You'll, you'll end up spending more. So just FY. But again, working with us, it's all fixed. You can usually go below. Second piece are the management fees. Now, management fees um, in the two and 20 model, it's kind of, they call it two and 20, but it's actually 20 and 20 because it's 2% average per year over 10 years of the fund life. So that's 20%. So if you raise $10 million, $2 million go to management fees. Now, 2% per year. So that's 200,000 per year, average. Now, the problem with that is that most of your work on a fund is in the first, call it three years, right? And after that, you're harvesting, right? So maybe you're on the board for five years, which would be a lot. Let's say if you're doing a board, most people don't do boards. Uh, so your, most of your work is the first three years. Maybe there's some more work in year four and five, helping the company with different things. But after that, you're just waiting for returns. So you put your management fees in what's called a waterfall. So it's not uncommon to see three to 4%, 4% is very high, but 3% you see very commonly in the first three years and then it declines down over time. So in year you know, eight, nine, and 10, it could be 0.5% or 0.25%. So we'll cover all these waterfalls in the program. And what that allows for, by the way, is that you have enough budget in the early years to run your fund correctly. And so usually two years after your fund launches, you'll do your second fund and then you're gonna have management fees stacking. So you might have 300,000 coming in on a 10 year fund on year three, cause you're doing 3% per year for the first three years. You launch your second fund, it's usually bigger. Maybe you have 600,000 coming in on your second fund. And now you're looking at more like a 900,000 a year budget in year three. So. A lot of people are like, I can't make money with smaller fund sizes. It's just not true. You, you, you shouldn't be making money on management fees anyway. Okay. You, this is a carry based business. You should be like ramen profitable on management fees and like make lots of money on carried interest. That's the goal of venture investing. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. I over answered that one. Uh, remind me not to give lessons. <laughs> Take a little time. Okay. What are the requirements for a GP to complete the program? What criteria can lead to teams being excluded from the accelerator? Um, from Andre. Uh, so you have to close on capital to be a graduate. And you can either close on capital during the four months of the program. We give you about a year grace period after the program's over, but we'll be checking in with you. If you do not graduate, we eliminate you from everything. So if you do not close on capital, we eliminate you from everything. So like if you're not closing on capital during the program, we ask you to leave. If you haven't closed on program after the program's over, we ask you to leave. So the 500 and something firms that we've created all have either 
closed on capital or about to close on capital? And what criteria can lead to teams being excluded? Look, like we're, we're introducing in this batch interviews. We, we previously would just rely on your video and um, on your submitted materials. We're, we're not, we're, look, it's super hard to close a venture capital firm. So we wanna look for people who have the wherewithal, the network and the real passion to do it because it's hard. And we're not going to, we're not trying to just work with the absolute best of the best, the best. We have the absolute best, the best, the best coming in the program. There's that three, last time we had 3,600 applicants. We accepted, you know, under 300. So, and, and of those roughly, you know, 50 to hundred will graduate. Okay, so that's that's the waterfall. 3,600, call it 280, call it 50 to 100, right? Probably 75 for, okay? That's to close. So we're looking for the people that can get be in the 75. It's hard, right? We make it as easy as possible and it's still hard. Um, okay, uh, Gontan is asking, uh, can we meet alumni who successfully launched their VC firms? Like guys, there are 3,600 people that apply. Uh, no, like, yes. I mean, they're, they're not hidden. Uh, Geek Ventures closed. Just go to our website and watch videos with them and stuff. If 30, and, and by the way, north of 70% of all the people that apply, of the 3,600 people that apply are referred. So it's not like you probably know you're probably in the program because someone told you to come to the program, right? So it's mainly a referral based program. Uh, and there, you can watch videos with them, hear what they think by just going to govclab.com. Maybe Domenica, you could put a link into some graduate uh, videos on there. We're featuring graduates and events all the time. But in terms of reaching out and trying to speak with them, I, you know, that would be a giant waste of their time. They're 3,600 people per cohort. And, you know, they're 500 graduates. That's just not, not a plausible dynamic to, to undergo. But we have plenty of ways to see what they think, experience what they get. And the program has an 87. It has ranges between an 83 and an 87 NPS. Okay. The product and our back office stuff has a 94 NPS. Okay, just to give you a sense. Um, okay, Alexis is asking, does Dessel Hub charge GPs after they graduated? No, um, there is a premium component to Dessel Hub. Um, and we, if you run your whole back office with us, that costs. So right, because we have costs that AI is not free, all this stuff's not free. So there's a $99 a month to unlock all the AI stuff. You have two months for free. We're about to give everyone on it two months for free right now. Uh, and that's just because we have costs with some of the, so the product is free, but some of the AI and other things that we have to pay for, you have to pay for. And that's $99 a month, but you get a couple months of it for free. Um, but you can use everything else without the AI and these other things that cost us money for free. Um, then in terms of you use the back office, we have three packages based on the size of your fund. It's 25, 40, or 60,000 a year. Most people are 25,000 a year. And it replaces about $60,000 of other things that you would spend money on. Um, so if you were to do the same stuff that we offer with like Carta, AngelList, or whatever, it would cost you 60,000 or more a year. And we're charging 25. Um, how much, what is the ideal amount for the first fund? I'm, I'm guessing you're asking fund size and remember to keep upvoting. Um, this is a question from Fuddy. Uh, so what I would say is it really depends if you're in a developing uh, on your thesis, on you, on what you can do. But as I mentioned, it's like two, five or 10 should be 90% of people. Two in developing markets, if your network's not that strong, 
five in developing markets if your network is strong, five in developed markets if your network's not that strong, 10 in developed markets if your network's strong. Two, five, 10, right? That should be your target fund size for everybody here. There's exceptions. If you're like super famous or you're like exited and like made investors billions of dollars, maybe you could, I would say you could do a 15 or 20, maybe, um, but you have to really be a pretty exceptional human being to, 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 to go for larger fund size. Keep in mind, you want to beat whatever you say your fund size is. So even if you say it's 20, you might be shooting for 40. Um, but because you want to beat 20 and you want to beat it ideally by as much as 2x. Um, let me refresh here and see who's got a top voted question. See how all the questions are coming in. And there's only 10 minutes left. I told you this would happen. Uh, Nihal is asking, I've often been told that having a track record as a founder is crucial for LPs to de-risk their investments. Uh, no. Uh, the, the most important track record that matters, Nihal, and maybe um, Domenica, we have a whole article on track record on GoVC Lab. So search GoVC Lab track record, and we quantify which track record elements LPs care about the most. Founder track record is literally bottom, last, years of ex with years experience. It's your investing track record matters. Uh, so, um, I don't know who told you this. There's a lot of, by the way, most things you hear about emerging managers and new managers are wrong. Okay. The media is reporting, no one's investing in new and emerging managers. We have all time high levels of investments on our system. We're seeing all time high level of investments into emerging managers cohort 15 has the all-time high fundraising record. So uh, clearly people are investing in new and emerging managers and uh, they're at all-time highs. So all this stuff you're reading is just horse manure. Um, the other things that you commonly hear, a lot of common with, oh, you need a large fund size. And a lot of LPs are like, oh, your fund size is too small. Okay, you know, Okay, now, oh, you know what? I took your advice. Now I have a $25 million fund. Oh, well, you know, it's Friday, so we're not investing because of Friday. Okay, now it's Monday. Can we invest now because it's Monday? No, no, not now, you know, uh, we, we've allocated all our money this quarter. It's next quarter. Can you invest now? No, you know, for the year. It's uh, So, like, LPs will tell you things like your fund size is too small or whatever, and that's just their polite way of telling you no. It's not that your fund size is actually too small. And then a lot of these uh, GPs will be like, oh man, your fund size is really small. And it's like, well, I'm great GP. I'll make my fund size larger if you want to anchor it with a $10 million investment. Oh, oh, oh God, I would never do that. Like, so they, they like, just take a lot of the stuff you hear uh, with a grain of salt. Most of it's wrong. A lot of it's bullshit. And, you know, you, you know, if you want ever to hear the facts, I'm happy to translate something you heard from someone into what the truth is. Um, uh, Charles is asking a few questions here. Guys, one question at a time uh, in, the, in the thing and try and keep them short and sweet. Um, I'm already in the program. I'm so excited to take this journey. I'm based out of SG. I'm guessing that's Singapore. And we have our own set of uh, regulatory approvals, MAS, so it is Singapore. Um, I want to understand more how you're helping global fund managers. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Singapore is um, a terrible jurisdiction. I'm sorry for you. You're going to, yeah. So Basically, uh, we work with global funds. Uh, we we actually, our back office is in um, the US, uh, Canada, a Dominican Republic, uh, no, BVI, excuse me. Uh, I don't know why I said Dominican Republic, uh, and at Europe. And so those are the four domiciles that we support for our back office. And we work with funds literally in every 
domicile everywhere around the world. Um, the Singapore is brutal though. Uh, you know, they're super slow, super bureaucratic, lots of rules and regulations. It, it, it's going to take you years to navigate years. Okay. So, um, I don't want to divert the entire call to talk about it, but it is a super slow, and we've actually worked with Singapore authorities and said, can we, can we accelerate this? And blah, blah, blah. How can we do this? And can we do that? And they're just like, let me get back to you in like nine months. It's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> you can't even talk with them about accelerating the process on an accelerated scale. It's like super slow and tedious. So my recommendation to you would be move. Uh, Right. If you want to start a fund in Singapore, you have two choices, spend years or move. Um, it's that simple. OK, let's keep going. Uh, let me reload. Take a moment now and upvote because we have a few minutes left. Um, should we consider modeling and uh, recycled fees and funds into our first fund? Uh, I would say no. Like recycling is a very complicated concept and you want to get done with fund one as quickly as possible. So it's very hard to do recycling. It's very hard to explain recycling to LPs and it elongates the time that you're stuck in fund one. And your goal of fund one is to get to fund two. Your goal of fund two is to get to fund three. Your goal of fund three is to get to fund four and stop being an emerging manager. Being an emerging manager is like being in the penalty box. So you don't want to be like, yeah, I'm in the penalty box. I'm going to punch the ref and get some extra time. Woo, extra time in the penalty box, said no one ever. Okay, so get out of the penalty box. Don't do recycling. It's complicated. Don't model it. Don't think about it out of the penalty box. All right, Guarv is asking, Wondering how a GP survives with a $1 million fund. Uh, don't worry about that. You're not going to survive with a $1 million fund. The minimum size of any fund that anyone can do anywhere in the world is like $2 million, And even that's kind of on the absolute smaller side. So I said two, five, and 10. Like two is like your the fees to run the fund will get very, very large. It'll be like half. Right. So you got to be very careful. Um, so two two million dollars is really the absolute smallest you can do. You cannot run a million dollar fund practically because the, the, the fees, expenses and costs are larger than, you know, the fund size. So it just doesn't work. So two is really the absolute minimum. And you have to be very cost efficient in a two million dollar fund. Uh is Decel Hub an all or nothing platform? Uh, no, I mean, lots of, so the Decel Hub, lots of people use Decel Hub for lots of different things. So number one, it's used for fundraising. Number two, it's used for the file system, which is fantastic. It's way better than DocSend or anything out there. It's like the best data room on the market. Actually, that's number three. Number two is AI. So number one is the fundraising. Number two is AI. Number three is the file system. So some people just use it for the file system. Some people just use it for fundraising. Uh, uh, some people mainly use it for AI. But so it's not, all, but uh, I would say about two thirds of people use it for everything. Um, and the other, you know, third-ish use it for maybe one or a couple different things, if that makes sense. So it's not necessarily, you don't have to use everything in the platform. Uh, and yes, you can, you don't subscribe to the different features. They're all the features in the platform. So you can use whatever features suit you best. Okay, uh, Wisdom is asking, what's your advice for someone who wants to launch a fund successfully completing Venture Institute? Um, so, you know, Venture Institute's a training program on the basics of venture capital. Uh, you can apply and see if you can get into uh, VC Lab. That would be the best next step. Uh, VC Lab is the best way in the world today to launch a venture capital firm and fund, period, end of story. So maybe 
I know we have a bunch of questions left here and I can run over, but let me leave a closing point for the people that need to drop off quickly. And then I'll get to a few more questions. So um, we're here to help. And I know that maybe you don't get in VC lab this time around because there's thousands of people that applied, but we're here to help. And that's why we're gonna to continue to reach out to you. We're gonna to continue to offer resources. We're gonna to continue to offer training opportunities, events and the like, because if you wanna launch a firm and a fund, and maybe we don't think you're ready right now, I wanna do everything in my power to train and upscale and help you to get ready to do that. Because I think, as I said, our goal is to transform venture capital into a force for good in the world. And we need thousands of more funds everywhere on the planet in order to really help humanity solve the grand challenges that we're facing and make this a world that we can be proud of. We need funds in Asia. We need funds in Africa. We need funds in Latin America. We need funds everywhere because I know that there are entrepreneurs in almost every city on the planet working on important ideas that need capital and they do not have access to funding today because there's only about a couple dozen cities in the world that have thriving venture capital ecosystems. And yet there are 500 major cities in the world, most of whom have no venture capital ecosystem at all. Okay, so uh, I'll take a few more questions. I'll run over. Let me just double check that I don't have something on my calendar that's pressing. I may, so let me just double check. Uh, no, the, I, di I did, but they canceled. Uh, it was a venture capital firm that is going to get a big one that's going to get onboarded to Dessal Hub, uh, but the manager had to change. Okay, so uh, I'll do a few more questions. So we'll run over a little bit. Um, converting my service company to a venture studio. We have invested in seven companies, all AR and VR. Are we a good fit for VC Lab? Yes. Um, generally speaking, we're not a huge fan of consulting or consultants. Uh, it, there's always that temptation to make money consulting. Uh, and so that flies in the face of being a venture capitalist, but we let's in lots of consultants and lots of venture studios. We're probably the number one accelerator of venture studios in the world. Venture studios, um, in order to be successful, they mostly have a fund. You don't need a fund to do a venture studio, but most do. So if you're launching a venture studio, I would say north of 80% uh, have an attached fund and that's why the program is very good. So absolutely, it should be a fit. Consulting bit's a little concerning. Um, Puyan is asking how many advisors should we have for our first fund and how many venture partners? Um, so we have uh, something, maybe if you could put the venture share agreement in there. So generally speaking for a, you're gonna fire most of your advisors and uh, venture partners cause they're gonna suck. So it's a total kissing frogs adventure. A lot of people are like, oh, I'll be an amazing venture partner. I'm gonna do so much. Those are words uh, in reality, they don't. And then you're like, wow, why'd I do this? And you're gonna fire them. Uh, how do I know? We see it all the time. So we have a venture partner agreement that you can use. Thank you for posting it in the chat. It's, it talks about how to set up the relationship. It's got out. So if you let them go, it's very easy to do. And you'll probably want on a new fund, two to five venture partners um, to help. And you'll probably cycle through and end up with one or two by the time it's all said and done. Uh, Sahar is asking, is it common and, and viable to have your fund uh, arm length relationship with a separate nonprofit identity, especially if you're in the social impact space? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there, there definitely, the answer is yes. We see a lot of uh, relationships between funds and nonprofits, funds and endowments, funds and other sort of uh, social good vehicles. 
In fact, we have a whole article again on Go, Go VC Lab. Maybe you could put in a, a thing in, in four good metrics that funds can adopt and how to use that with uh, their portfolio companies. So it is common, but I, I, you know, don't count on a lot of value exchange. When you go out and launch a fund, like it's, it's going to be like climbing Mount Everest. It's like, and, and I, I like, we're going to be a Sherpa. Your nonprofit partner is going to be uh, the backpack, right? So you want a light backpack, you don't want a heavy backpack, right? So you want as little baggage as possible, slowing you down on the journey to climb Mount Everest. So you can have a relationship with them, but don't expect much from it and don't try and do too much with it. It will just slow you down. Um, couple, we'll do two more questions. Um, okay, what governance structures and operational strategies have you seen work best for funds operating across multiple jurisdictions? Generally speaking, I would say, you know, look, if you're doing multiple jurisdictions, you're almost definitely going to domicile your fund in the U.S., and it, you're just, it's very, very, very hard. They're harder to raise those funds uh, and they're harder to deploy those funds. And then they're harder to process exits from those funds. So you're, I just want to like make you guys aware that you're going in uh, to like the battle zone and, you know, you got a pea shooter uh, if you're because like it's just you're it's super hard right to to do a multi-jurisdictional fund right you have all the tax issues of the different jurisdictions all the regulatory issues of the different jurisdictions lps don't like their money because they're passed through vehicles all the lps have to worry about the tax and regulatory issues in the different jurisdictions so i heavily advise you to think hard about doing a multi-jurisdictional fund. I mean, even a pan-European fund is hard, right? Okay, last uh, question here. Let me see. Uh, there's a few questions about pitching and pitching LPs. So I'll just talk about it. again. We're gonna get you really good at pitching LPs in uh, limited partners in VC Lab. And for your first close, most of the LPs are going to be people that you know or people that uh, know well people you know. So first and second degree connections. Once you get that first close done and possibly the second close done, then you will be eligible to pitch our fund of funds, uh, and you will be eligible to enter the marketplace where you can be put in front of other limited partners. But if you can't get to a close on your own, it's just, you know, there's no amount of help that someone else will be able to do, right? Which we talked about before. But again, we're, we're going to help you get there. We know how to do it. I mean, I showed you earlier research tools to find LPs from your network that will work very well. Like it's like, and it took me about what? A minute. And I was demoing it to add LPs to your pipeline from your network, right? So this is, you know, we're going to help you do it. We have tools to help you do it. And we're going to make sure you can do it. So with that said, everybody, uh, we're here to help. This was lovely. Thanks for running over a few minutes, 10 minutes to be exact. And I really hope you have great success closing your firm and your fund with or without us, but we'd love to be part of the journey. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good one.